Hello, I am Andrew Hipsey. I am the Dean of the Fairmount College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. Thank you for joining us for the second talk of our brand new series, Perspectives Reestablishing Reality. This is where we invite experts to share their expertise to help us make sense of a world that has been upended. As we strive to live through the pandemic, we can feel confused by a thick blanket of information or misinformation that can be suffocating. Sometimes we feel that there really must be two realities or maybe even more. How do we make sense of a catastrophic event when the bare facts are disputed? And when a truth is rejected simply because it makes you feel uncomfortable. Our reestablishing reality series pulls the experts to center stage to help us to disentangle, pause, recalibrate, and find a way back to the long lost world of objectivity. A recurring and unsettling theme revolves around explanation. Holding on to a particular narrative is related to holding on to power. So what truth do you accept and why? To introduce our second speaker of the series, I would like to call on Dr. Jeffrey Jarman, the Kansas Health Foundation Distinguished Director of the Elliott School of Communication. Over to you, Jeff. Thank you very much. Uh, I have the great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Mark McCormick is the Director of Strategic Communications for the ACLU of Kansas African American Museum in Wichita. McCormick is a New York Times bestselling author with more than 20 years of experience as a reporter, editor, and columnist, and for 14 years worked as a journalist at the Wichita Eagle. He serves as a trustee for the University of Kansas William Allen White School of Journalism and Mass Communications, and has served as a professional in residence at the University of Oklahoma. Several years ago, our students here at Wichita State were fortunate when Mark taught two journalism classes for us in our department. He taught our uh, introductory reporting the news class and then the next semester advanced reporting. In 2015, McCormick published Some Are Paupers, Some Are Kings, Dispatches from Kansas, which was selected as the common read for Wichita State uh, first year students in 2020. Please help me welcome Mark McCormick who will deliver today's talk. Uh, I want to thank you both and all of my friends at Wichita State for letting me be a part of such an innovative and important discussion. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't begin with some thoughts about what's been happening in uh, Minnesota and in Virginia. Um, I did want to say briefly before I got into my remarks that really in defense of the police, um, I would hate for us to begin thinking of the police as some sort of separate entity. Um, I like to think of police as extensions of the community, as people who enforce um, the ideas and the mores that exist in the general community. Um, and to the extent that um, there are people dying uh, during traffic stops, um, this remains possible um, because there is more outrage in the larger community about being asked to wear a mask or more outrage about someone kneeling during the national anthem than there is about these extrajudicial kill killings uh, during these traffic stops. Um, but that said, I wanna to get to my remarks. Um, they'll be just under 28 minutes and then there'll be time for a discussion, I hope. But um, when I was speaking at Wichita State in the fall, I was in the elevator on my way to campus and the song playing in the elevator was Chattanooga Choo Choo. I don't know if you remember the lyrics, but it starts, pardon me, boy, is that the Chattanooga Choo Choo on track 29? And then it says, boy, you can give me a shine. I was wondering who the boy was in that. And I think we all know it's probably someone's father, someone's grandfather um, who had to carry this baggage 
in addition to some very real baggage uh, as a Pullman porter. So I wanna get right into my remarks and say, from the time I was an eighth grader at Adley Junior High there in Wichita, I, I knew I wanted to be a journalist. I was editor of the yearbook paper, of the yearbook and the newspaper there. And later at North High School, I was also the editor of the yearbook and the newspaper. I won a high school journalism feature writing award right there at Wichita State for a deadline story about an exchange student from Kuala Lumpur. I won a spot in the summer high school journalism workshop at KU that placed me on a glide path to a destination paper right out of college. But it wasn't until I saw Ralph Wiley that I knew what kind of journalist that I really wanted to be. I was in college in the late 1980s and I just sat through the ridiculous Tom Brokaw led documentary, The Black Athlete, in which researchers with straight faces explain that black athletes dominated certain sports requiring explosion because black people had more fast twitch muscles. They said white people dominated endurance events such as long distance running because they had slow twitch muscles. Insert eye roll here. By the end of the program, I was seething. A panel discussion followed the program where the panelists dove deeper into this stupid content. I noticed that one man on the panel, while sitting quietly, seemed to be managing a controlled rage. It was Ralph Wiley, then a reporter for Sports Illustrated. When it was his turn to speak, he didn't explode. He spoke with an even, quiet power. The notion of this program is racist and, and incorrect, Wiley deadpanned. The host seemed rattled by this frontal assault, but Wiley continued, rattling off a litany of facts that ran counter to the documentary's premise. Fast twitch muscles? Then how do you explain white athletes like Tom Chambers and John Elway? How do you explain the USA men's gold volleyball team with vertical jumps comparable to NBA players? How do you explain Valerie Borzov, the Soviet sprinter who won two Olympic gold medals in the 100 and the 200 meters? Slow twitch muscles? How do you explain Kenyans finishing one through eight in the Boston Marathon? This is the worst case of sour grapes since the fox couldn't get him, he said on the program. He closed coolly, sarcastically even, saying in substance, I guess black athletes just didn't work harder. I guess they didn't exercise any discipline in developing their abilities. They didn't sacrifice to achieve their goals. They're just naturally better. I remember sitting there feeling as though I had just seen a comet. I wasn't, I wasn't accustomed to this kind of racial candor and certainly not coming from such a confident and knowledgeable black man. In all my years as a consumer of news and information programming, I still can't think of anyone quite like Ralph Wiley. He had left most of the panel face down in the smoldering ruins of a flawed, racist, and poorly constructed narrative. And that's all it was, a narrative dressed up as science. It might as well have been eugenics. It'd be years later when I had a regular audience as a newspaper columnist and many more years before I realized the power of narratives. I've long been wary of narratives, which are quite powerful, but improving life for African-Americans in this nation will require not only deconstructing old narratives, but building new narratives deeply anchored in truth. Narratives that speak life rather than death into our spirits. Absurdist racial narratives have shaped our nation's current reality. Still, there are new efforts at asset framing designed to dismantle old deficit framing narratives and build a new reality. Voltaire wrote in the 1700s, that those can, who can make you believe absurdities can make you commit atrocities. You've likely heard this before, but this, is, but this so aptly explains our nation's current racial reality. The work of Dr. Carl Hart, the Columbia University psychology professor, neuroscience PhD, and self-described drug abuse scientist comes to mind immediately. 
Hart has argued for years that many of our misguided fears about drugs are rooted in horrid racial narratives. In an interview about his work, he said, we've paired these drugs with the behavior of groups we just don't like and behavior that we've exaggerated. So the drugs become more about these other issues that we've exaggerated and we're still doing that today. He said today's policies were born in the fear of intermingling between Chinese and white Americans in opium dens and in the racist sensationalizing of cocaine. This later narrative led to the 1914 Harrison Narcotics Tax Act, which he said actually prompted some Southern police forces. It's a hard time when I, 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 it's hard to believe that they did this, but it actually prompted some Southern police forces to switch to larger 38 caliber weapons in order to deal with the mythical black cocaineized superhuman. This headline is, one of, is in one of Dr. Hart's PowerPoint presentations, quote, Negro cocaine fiends are a new Southern menace, close quote. Here are the descriptions that followed. And it's from the same article, by the way. Cocaine produces several other conditions that make the fiend a peculiarly dangerous criminal. One of these conditions is a temporary immunity to shock a resistance to the knockdown effects of a fatal wound, bullets fired into vital parts that would drop a sane man in his tracks, fail to check the fiend. Most of the Negroes are poor, illiterate, shiftless. Once the Negro has formed the habit, he is irreclaimable. The only method to keep him away from taking the drug is by imprisoning him, and this is merely palliative, for he returns inevitably to the drug habit when he's released. Dr. Hart says the Harrison Act and the racial rhetoric stoked to buoy its passage set the tone for America's discriminatory drug policy and enforcement in the last century and today. He says that in 2010, one in eight black males aged 20 to 29 was in jail or in prison. He said black males represent 6% of the general population, but 35% of the incarcerated population nationally. Also according to Hart, 85% of those sentenced to crack cocaine offenses are black, despite the rates of usage being either relatively even or white people using the drug a little bit more. Consider this also, the black population in Kansas is 5.85%, but the black male uh, state prison population is about 29%. Now, I didn't say that the state's black male population was 5.8%. I said the state's black population was 5.85%. So really, you have to cut that 5.85% in half, at least, to find a closer representation of the state's black male population. So why is this important? Are we really comfortable as a supposedly conscientious society with black men who are two or three percent of the population making up nearly 30 percent of the state's prison population? Don't we have to ask to what degree racial narratives have shaped these numbers? And more important, what are we prepared to do about the cascading impact these negative and largely false narratives have had on communities, on families, on children? Are we prepared to acknowledge that teachers, police officers, prosecutors, judges, loan officers, legislators, office managers, and other authority figures operate based on these narratives and are imbued with the authority to enforce these narratives to tragic and devastating effect. The road to this current reality has been paved with lies. Misinformation and lies today masquerade as history. Professor Hassan Kwame Jeffries of Ohio State University says it's not history that we love, but nostalgia. Nostalgia is a kind of drug we all ingest. And as Dr. Hart might suggest, the effects of the drug are predictable, but there's an ever-present danger of overindulgence. I want to share a couple of takes on this subject from two incredible thinkers. The first is Randall Robinson, 
an African-American lawyer, author, and activist, and the founder of Trans Africa, the largest and oldest social justice organization in the United States focused on the African world. The second is the late great historian, John Hope Franklin. I had an African and African-American studies emphasis as a part of my journalism degree at Kansas, and we use Dr. Franklin's book as one of our primary texts. First, Randall Robinson, who spoke about the big lie in a 2002 speech in, at the University of Minnesota says, quote, the notion of Black History Month is ludicrous on its face, but it is so telling. You can't segregate history. The story of America is the story of America. It begins with the story of the first Americans left untold. It involves the story of Hispanic Americans who would explain to us why Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona are not today a part of Mexico. It goes on to tell us the contributions of Asian Americans and it involves in some central wealth building way the significant indispensable contribution of African Americans. He continues, to have Black History Month is tantamount to a confession that American history is a lie and not wholly told. Dr. Franklin speaks to this very issue in a 1969 speech in which he says, many persons confused about whether Negro Americans have a history believe that history is primarily an account of the great moments in the, in the experience of mankind. For such persons, it is inconceivable that Negroes could be involved in history, whether that history be past politics or the record of nations possessing a spiritual quality or the account of a man solving the problems he encounters. They're great moments and Negroes don't have great moments. Dr. Franklin continues saying, thus it is inconceivable many white Americans have convinced themselves that people occupying such a low point in the human family could have a history. Indeed, the inferior position in American life that they hold could only be maintained if the fiction of them as people with no history worth telling could be maintained. Let me say that last part again. Their inferior condition could be maintained only if the fiction of them as people with no history worth telling could be maintained. So this fiction doesn't only harm the people robbed of their history, it also harms the people who have convinced themselves that their perspective is not just the preferred perspective, but it is the only perspective. Said Dr. Franklin, this is the kind of history that has been written, and this is the kind of history that has been taught in our schools and our colleges. It is uninformed, arrogant, uncharitable, undemocratic, and racist history. It has thus spawned and permeated and perpetuated an ignorant, self-seeking, super patriotic, ethnocentric group of white Americans who can say at this day and time that they did not know that Negroes had a history. Now, again, this was a speech delivered in 1969. So at this point, we can no longer view these efforts as crimes of omission. This is in many respects a crime of commission, an active effort to once again inter history that has been stubbornly excavated in an attempt for a more complete truth. And this is clear in the continued efforts to deny Latinx students in the Southwest any access to Chicano studies. A 2012 article that I found said that La Raza studies in the Tucson area school district were literally made illegal under a house bill that claims such studies promoted resentment toward a race or class of people were designed primarily for pupils of a particular ethnic group and advocate ethnic solidarity. Consider the 2015 Texas textbook controversy in which enslaved Africans were referred to as workers, implying that these workers were somehow being paid. The textbook company apologized for the mistake, but are we really to believe this was inartful or clumsy phrasing? Consider the concerted efforts underway right now to undermine the New York Times Pulitzer Prize winning 1619 series, the series that sought to reframe the country's history by placing the consequences of slavery 
and the contributions of African Americans at the very center of our national narrative, the usual suspects are fighting to keep this history hidden. Arkansas Senator Tom Cotton, for example, attacked the series, referring to it as, and this might sound familiar, racially divisive, and a revisionist account of history that denies the noble principles of freedom and equality on which our nation was founded, unquote. Cotton also introduced legislation that would prevent federal funds and professional development grants from being given to any school teaching the 1619 Project. President Trump, who I guess at some point seemed to believe that abolitionist Fred Frederick Douglass was still alive, established the 1776 Commission to support what he called patriotic education. This commission released a January report that historians quickly condemned as filled with errors and as partisan. So again, there are conscious active campaigns to maintain the current narrative. And let me pause here for a moment. Um, I've always found it interesting how eager some people in that camp are to critique black people and critique black culture. They will expound uninvited on welfare queens, on the mythical absent black fathers. Uh, they refer to our kids as thugs and worse. Have you ever noticed how thin skinned they become when they become the focus of critique? But that's another speech. Dr. Franklin says, if there was slavery, injustice and unspeakable barbarities, the selling of babies from their mother, the breeding of slaves, the lynchings, burnings at the stake, the discrimination and segregation, these things too are part of them. American history. If the patriots were more in love with slavery than freedom, if the founding fathers were more anxious to write slavery into the constitution than they were to protect the rights of men, and if freedom was begrudgingly given and ineffectively denied for another century, these things too were part of the nation's history. It takes a person with a stout heart and great courage and uncompromising honesty to look the history of this country squarely in the face and tell it like it is, but nothing short of this will make it possible to have a reassessment of American history, for there is nothing so irrelevant in the telling the truth as the color of a person's skin. So I'll conclude this section with Randall Robinson's comments about Herodotus, whom I will at the forefront concede that many historians don't consider a viable source. But Robinson says in his speech, Herodotus, the great Greek historian wrote 500 years before the birth of Christ that everything the ancient, that ancient Greek Greece was, its calendar, its division of the year into 12 parts, its language, its math, its science, its gods, its mythology, its practice of carving figures in stone, all of it, according to Herodotus, 500 years before the birth of Christ had been derived from older civilizations to the south, the civilizations of Egypt, in Ethiopia. There is no worse crime you could commit against the people, he says, than to strip them of the story of themselves. So what is this story Robinson is referencing here? What should this new narrative look like? There are pieces of the truth here and there, and we need only to gather them and properly place them for our new mosaic. And I'm going to speak directly to African Americans here for a moment. We're the only people who arrived here as literal assets. At one point in our nation's history, our bodies were worth more than all of the industries underway here combined. There has never been a time in which we have not been assets to our communities, to the larger society, to ourselves. But somehow we've been convinced that we have no use or utility and we beat up on ourselves too much. We do this because we don't yet understand who we are. African Americans are going to have to unlearn some things as we build a new narrative. The fact is, says my friend Travian Shorters, that too many Black leaders loathe Black people out of sheer habit. Travian is a former Knight Ritter Foundation vice president who has designed and who leads elite fellowships for Black professionals. He says he has worked with hundreds of Black leaders 
who have a deeper commitment to liberty and justice for all than the founding fathers ever did. But they have been taught to try and lift our people up by running us all down in the dirt so that they might get a dime of funding for every dollar that we're actually worth. This is a practice he calls deficit framing or defining people by their challenges and by their difficulties. Trabian says we are absolutely some of the most enterprising people in the country. And he says, we absolutely must end this self-deprecating, denigrating and insulting way of gaining agency. We don't have to prime every thought, he says, of black people with denigration. The inequalities and the injustice that we face are real, but that's not what defines us. Trabian's new narrative for African-Americans is literally the acronym LOVE which stands for live, own, vote, and excel. We get there by asset framing, which is simply defining people by their aspirations instead of by their deficits. Asset framing actually speaks life into people. Deficit framing kills our spirits. If more people understood, again, I'm quoting Trabian here, if more people understood that black people do actually vote at among the highest rates, that they do defend this country in uniform at higher rates, that they do father and care for children at, at, at higher rates, they do start and own businesses at higher rates, they do maintain hope and take care of others, that we do all of these things at some of the highest rates in America, then all efforts to block our freedoms could be seen more clearly as the outright injustices that they are. And if you don't believe me, I brought some receipts. Um, if you go to the Brookings Institution site, look up a story, uh, their study, uh, with the heading, Black People Vote at Very High Rates. Um, if you go to census.gov, look up the article, Black People Start Businesses at Twice the National Average. Go to Think Progress and find the story, Black fathers are most engaged dads. Go to the United States Army website and read the article, Black people enlist and serve the country at the highest rates. Go to the Washington Post and find the story that says Black people give to charities at the highest rates. Go back to the Brookings Institution site and find the story that says Black people are the most optimistic of Americans. So you see, this is all right here in front of us. This habit the nation has of stigmatizing black people makes the narrative of black incompetence more believable. These alibis aid and abet systemic thievery, fraud and slander, and it must stop. Trabian says, we are now and have always been so valuable that battles are still fought today to own us, to own our narrative, to own our communities, to claim our aspirations and our contributions. As Public Enemy said, it takes a nation of millions to hold us back. So I'll conclude pretty much how I began. As I said earlier, lies become absurdities and absurdities become horrors. They also become history and popular culture. As I mentioned in my convocation presentation, I once spent a few days with the late great Egyptologist Asa Hilliard. Dr. Hilliard's presentation Free Your Mind, Return to the Source, still reverberates in my mind almost 30 years later. In his speech, he talked about a book that was popular at the time called Cultural Literacy by E.D. Hirsch. The book was being billed as everything you need to know in order to be a cultured American. But what bothered Dr. Hillier about the book was that 80 to 90% of it was about the Greeks, not about the Africans from the older cultures who taught the Greeks. So quote, you could be literate and ignorant at the same time, unquote, he said of the book and its audience. These wayward narratives are all around us. The John Stuart Curry mural of John Brown in our state capital is another such example. If you read Lies My Teacher Told Me by James Lowen, you'll learn that this narrative of Brown as insane comes in part from a decidedly racist idea that to see the depth of humanity that Brown saw in black people must make him insane. In fact, Lowen talks at length about how American textbooks 
used to try and portray Brown as insane, even saying erroneously that several members uh, in his immediate family and extended family were insane. These corrosive narratives seep deeply into how we think about each other. Professor, Her Professor Eddie Glaude in his book, Begin Again, devotes an entire chapter and the foundation of his book to what he calls simply the lie. The lie, Glaude says in the book, is several sets of lies with a single purpose. If America is, as he says, uh, the place where white lives matter more than others, then the lie is the broad and powerful architecture of false assumptions supporting that narrative. He says, we breathe them like air. We count them as truths. We absorb them into our character. One set of lies debases black people and the examples stretch from the writings of the founding fathers to the bell curve. According to these lies, he says, black people are inferior to white people and are deserving of their station in American life. Quote, we see these lies every day in the stereotypes that black people are lazy, dishonest, promiscuous, prone to criminal behavior and only seeking a handout from big government. Glaud says another lie involves mainstream ideas about American history and the trauma America has visited throughout that history on people of color, both at home and abroad. According to these lies, America is fundamentally good and innocent. It's bad deeds dismissed as mistakes, there's that word again, mistakes, corrected on the way to a more perfect union. Each atrocity, Glaude says, the genocide of native peoples, slavery, racial apartheid, the Japanese internment, the subjugation of women, represented, Glaude says, a profound revelation about who we are as a country. James Baldwin in a 1964 essay termed this, quote, the white problem. And he summed it up this way. The people who settled the country had a fatal flaw. They could recognize a man when they saw one. They knew he wasn't anything else but a man. But since they were Christian, and since they had already decided that they had come here to establish a free country, the only way to justify the role this chattel was playing in one's life was to say that he was not a man. For if he wasn't, then no crime had been committed. And that lie is the basis for our present trouble. So because I try to view the world through a hopeful rather than a hopeless prism, I'll end with my original thought that maybe we all ought to strive to become more like Ralph Wiley. We have to boldly and confidently and unflinchingly speak to any and all of these distorted narratives that are often passed off as history or scholarship. There's power in this practice, power for us. There's power in naming, says artist and filmmaker Raoul Peck, who also explains that history is just a projection of power. If I have the power over you, I have the power to shape history the way I want to shape history, not necessarily how it actually unfolded. So let's name this narrative and embody the counter narrative as Ralph did. Ralph died fairly young. And I don't think of myself as very young at all, but Ralph died when he was about my age. I'd always wanted to meet him and tell him how much he had meant to my professional life and in my personal life. I regret that I never got to meet him. Some of my greatest mistakes in life have had to do with me believing that I had more time than I actually had. We can't wait. The risk of idleness here are just too great. We need to, like Ralph did in his short, bright life, be the comet of truth that sends sparks across an otherwise dark sky. And more than that, we should make any and all sky gazers accustomed to seeing such comets of truth more than just once a generation. We have to make such sightings much more common. Thank you for listening. I'm speechless, Mark. <laughs> Thank you so much for spending time with us this afternoon. I, um, I have a question to ask you in a few minutes, but I wanna turn to the chat now. We do have one question from, um, I think it's Kaylee Ball. Uh, in conversation with someone recently, 
Caleb, I'm sorry, Caleb Ball. Uh, in con conversation with someone recently, they quoted- Again, this is one of those narratives that has taken root, not just in the culture, but, but frankly, uh, in journalism as well. Um, in the same way that police are extensions of the communities where we live and where we serve, I think journalists are the same way. Um, they carry some of those biases with them into the newsroom and into the coverage. Um, but I would simply say that, that um, in most cases, uh, if you're killed, it's, it's by someone that you knew or, or someone who looks like you. Okay, from Gretchen Ike uh, from Newman University, I believe. I've been reviewing the 11th grade US history standards for Kansas and discovered all that is missing, 1619, 1660s when enslavement became ra legally racialized, lynching, the Great Migration, Jim Crow, et cetera, et cetera. Also, there's nothing on indigenous Americans beyond the ancient Central American groups and a paragraph on the Great Plains. Would you like to comment on that, Mark? Oh, sure. Um, our schools are uh, more than complicit in perpetuating these um, these narratives, as uh, Dr. Franklin uh, said much more eloquently than I could. Um, if you have not, I would recommend everyone uh, here today uh, carve out some time to watch the Raul Peck um, documentary, Exterminate All the Brutes. Um, it's a four part, four hour uh, documentary uh, about these very subjects that we've been talking, that I've been talking about today. Uh, and it gets at these in a way that is not just a recitation, uh, but really tries to understand why these things happen. Um, it is very powerful. Uh, Mark Gretchen is asking if you would put the documentary title in the chat, please. Sure, sure. Okay, and other questions for Mark as he's putting that information in. This question from Keith Pickus in history. How can we both rewrite our national history to be more inclusive and simultaneously reestablish the collective bonds and vision for the future required to bind a nation together? Uh, appreciate that question, Keith. I would say by putting uh, events at the center and uh, examining those events from different perspectives. Um, if you put the expansion westward, for example, Manifest Destiny, and you examine it um, from the perspective of white Americans, um, I think you'd have one perspective, but if you examine it from the perspective of indigenous peoples, um, you'd have a very different perspective. If you looked at it from the perspective of uh, freed or enslaved Africans, you'd have a different perspective. It would simply be uh, about keeping the event at the center and exploring it from different cultural points of view. I, I would say that that's what we have to do first. And I think then we could come away with a greater sense of respect one for the other, um, where we get at um, uh, the truth for one group uh, and their perspective, as well as the truth for another group and their perspective. Thanks, Mark. Uh, a question from Meredith Dwyer. I have elementary age children. What resources do you recommend for me to use or reference to help them have a more complete and realistic understanding of our history? Um, I'll just make a shameless plug here, but um, I think the Kansas African American Museum, uh, where I was for a total of six years, uh, is a great resource and it is largely untapped. Um, when I was the executive director there, 
we hosted a lot of uh, homeschooling groups. We'd have groups of about 50 students uh, who came uh, from as far away as Hutchinson uh, to get a little bit of this history. And um, even for little kids, um, we had an executive director at one point, uh, Prisca Barnes, um, who would read to them. She's written a book about the Dockham sit-in, uh, which I would recommend. And uh, there was another book she used to read to them called Wagon Wheels about how the people who eventually settled Nicodemus had traveled to Kansas, uh, the Kansas territory from Kentucky. And um, you know, she read the book to them. Uh, I would begin there um, because one, um, I believe in the mission of the museum. And um, I also believe that there are resources there that would benefit everyone. So that's one place where I would start. Okay, we have a question. Thank you, Mark. We have a question from Aaron. How do you or we manage the balance of promoting the needs, truths, and realities of Black people with the pressure of feeling obligated to constantly educate white people? Well, that is a heavy question. Um, and that, that question really might be above my pay grade. <laughs> Um, I, I think we just have to be purposeful and intentional um, about telling the truth as often as possible and make it about telling the truth and about being as transparent as we possibly can uh, and not making it about necessarily teaching people who need to be taught, um, but putting the, putting the information out there um, for them to, to learn. Uh, I also think it's, it would be a wonderful idea to have more discussions about these, these, um, these elements of history rather than putting them out just for people to absorb, but to discuss them. And if people had a different point of view or a different perspective to welcome that, uh, and uh, you, you almost need um, these different points of view to make for a, a meaningful discussion. So I think we would, I'm not afraid of uh, any of the ideas. Um, let's put the ideas in, a, in an arena and let the ideas kind of fight it out. And we, we'd all come away with a clearer sense for how people uh, think and what they believe and how they arrived at those ways of thinking. Um, but I think I would rather see us as a nation um, engage each other, uh, engage ideas that we don't agree with rather than retreating to our corners um, and throwing rocks at each other. Mark, here's a question from Angela. How do you engage people into a true version of history that includes the full history of all Americans when they were taught something very different? It has been my experience that the most curious types of people are open to learning, while the majority of people seem uninterested in learning about subjects that they do not feel is relevant to them, even if history is relevant to all of us. Well, I, I would say again, that's why teachers are so important. That um, um, if there aren't points of view represented in the groups of people that you're talking to, I think we're obligated to try and present those points of view to people, uh, whether they're in the room or not. Uh, I think we have to understand different points of view uh, and present them to people. Um, I think that's the best answer that I could offer. Um, but I, on a more practical level, I think what we really need is sort of a wholesale revisiting of how we teach uh, history. Um, how we engage history. I, you know, I remember being in a history class in high school and it was um, an accelerated course. And I, I actually had uh, well-meaning classmates and only half joking uh, say that there were no African-Americans until the civil rights movement. And there were no Africans until the civil rights movement. That's just how little they had been taught. Um, we have to fundamentally change how we approach um, all of this content. Uh, 
and as the society becomes uh, more diverse, more multicultural, more multiracial than ever before, um, this approach is more important than ever before. I hope I'm answering that question. Um, uh, Gretchen Mike has also has suggested that another resource at close at hand is your book, Mark, of uh, short columns that are very, very eye-opening. Some, some were poppers, some were kings, dispatches from Kansas. Um, so there's a, there's a lengthy comment associated with that, I want, but I want to move on to some questions too. Um, uh, another comment from Susan Castro uh, from the philosophy department. She wanted to offer a connection between Jeff Jarman's talk from last week and Mark's talk today that the stories we tell can be far from, can be far more powerful and more difficult to deny than assertions from friends and foes. Uh, foregrounding the narrative is a necessary counter to motivated reasoning. And then a question from Chinari Okafor from Women's Studies. The social conditioning begins from the cradle through the media, infants watch. How can we engage major the majority who don't have the opportunity to get counter stories as they grow up, go to school and work? What about the churches and their stories? Um, could you share that last part again? Not the whole thing, but just that last part. What about the churches and their stories? Oh, that's interesting. Um, I'm not very, I'm not sure about that part of it. Um, but maybe answering it this way would, would be helpful. So years and years ago, uh, when I was a cub reporter, um, and I, I can't take credit for like coming up with this complete idea myself, but when I started a new newspaper beat, there was a particular way that I started the beat. And it was basically going back and reading the last 10 front page stories on the subject that I was uh, writing about. So I was a religion writer uh, in Louisville, Kentucky. So I went back and I read the last 10 stories that were on the front page about religion. Uh, I found 10 sources in those 10 stories and I talked to each of them and I asked each of them for 10 other sources and 10 other stories. And the whole idea about doing that was to, one, get an understanding about what was actually happening on the beat. What were the big news stories that were in the beat? But it was also casting a wide net so that I was getting all of these different perspectives. Well, that's really something that we really haven't done when it came to history. It's kind of one point of view from one perspective. And we've actually gotten to the point now in the country that if you don't believe this particular point of view, you are no longer patriotic. So what I'm getting at in today's talk and just in general is that um, the worst thing that we could do is um, base our understanding of history on one source, that we need multiple sources, multiple perspectives, uh, multiple stakeholders. And frankly, as a society, we do a poor job of making sure that all the stakeholders are at the table when we're dividing things up. Okay. There's a question from Jay Price, also from history. Great conversation, Mark, always thought provoking and I could use some advice. There are times when I try to have this conversation with folks in the community and get the response, I work with black people and they don't agree with the Black Lives Matter activism and feel it does not represent them. How do you respond to those assertions? Well, that's interesting. Um, the, um, the BLM phenomenon is very, very interesting. Um, if you go back to the civil rights movement, um, a lot of students were involved but it was largely um, a, a, a clergy-led movement. Um, certainly clergy were involved. Um, I don't see the same level of involvement from clergy in the BLM movement. In fact, 
the people who started it, um, some of the people are queer. And um, I think that is a reaction to how slowly the mainstream African-American church has reacted um, to people who are LGBTQ. Um, there are people who are frustrated with their tactics. Uh, that division um, probably does have some, some historical similarities. Um, Mark Twain says that um, history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. And in this case, um, there were clearly people who thought that um, the Black Panther Party and the Southern Christian, um, I mean, in, a, in the um, SCLC, um, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, I mean, um, they didn't like their tactics uh, relative to what the Southern Christian Leadership Conference was doing. Um, I think we still see the same kinds of class divisions uh, as today, but I would just remind people that there has to be some agitation um, so that the other group that is also pushing uh, for some of the same causes uh, can make uh, some, some headway. I think there were a lot of people looking at uh, SNCC uh, and the more militant side of the civil rights movement and decided, well, if we have to deal with one of them, we'd rather deal with Dr. King. So in that, in that sense, the more radical voices didn't really get the credit that they deserved. Uh, I think the same is true with BLM, uh, simply declaring that Black people's lives matter, that it just matter, uh, shouldn't be controversial. And um, they may be buying uh, a false narrative because uh, the BLM marches that I've seen that involved actual BLM people and people coming out to support BLM, uh, they tend to be peaceful. But there are others who take advantage of the marches uh, and use them as an opportunity uh, to throw rocks and to loot. Um, but there was a an activist in the 60s who used to say, you know, if you want your freedom, sometimes you have to act dumb. That's why they call it free dumb. And that that pressure and that pushing um, is critical uh, to creating the kind of productive uh, temperature that leads to change. Um, um, I guess I'll leave it there for Jake. Mark, history teachers have university degrees. What is a university's role in revisiting K through 12 history teaching? Oh, that's, a, that's great. Um, you know what, that's not my expertise. But if I'm being asked, um, you know, I, I'm an old religion writer and I'm not sharing this because I'm talking about, uh, that I'm trying to proselytize. But I think in the same way that an effective church operates beyond, the, beyond its walls, um, and a, a good university, is operating beyond the boundaries of the campus. And I think there are things that universities could do in working with the school districts in their respective communities uh, to alter, to change, to infuse, to improve, to engage how many subjects are taught, um, history included. Um, you know, Gretchen is on this call and uh, I'm a big fan of hers and um, her book, uh, Descent in Wichita should be required reading. I mean, it, there's powerful, powerful history in the book. And I think just developing partnerships, um, you know, between the campus and the community outside the campus are key. And um, in the same way that as a reporter, I had to develop relationships with people who would trust me with information I, I think the university should have uh, relationships with different schools, um, with the school district, and kick around these ideas. I think some of this is just about creativity and innovation. And Wichita State actually has an innovation campus and an innovation spirit um, that I think really lends itself to these kinds of discussions. 
uh, we just have the courage. We just have to have the courage to to reach out and and try to make some of these things happen. And Gretchen has a response back to you uh, with that same line of thought. The teachers are being trained by history departments that don't teach African American, Native American, Latino American, or Asian American history, and don't include them like you propose as part of each event studied. From Van Williams, a question for you. First a comment, then a question. What of insightful speech? A personal question or two. Are you encouraged or troubled by America's current racial climate, including recent events in Minnesota? And how do you stay inspired to keep fighting these issues you've championed for so many years? What do you do when you're tired of the struggle? Oh, uh, good question from a big brother. Um, I'm both encouraged and discouraged. Um, we're at a point now where um, if you recall, in the two most recent cases, the people who were stopped by police were terrified. Um, the young man who was in the military kept driving because he wanted to be in a well-lit place um, that would accommodate video. He was terrified to get out of the car because he was being confronted by people who protect and serve. Um, the young man in Minnesota who ran must have been terrified, having been stopped by the police. He was terrified and ended up being shot. Um, as these situations continue to mount, um, it's becoming more and more clear, not just in these situations, but when we have the situation in Washington on January 6th, as a way of comparison to how some people are confronted by law enforcement and how others are. I think this also raises larger questions about how we police. Um, should we consider, for example, not having the same kind of traffic enforcement? If you're a Sandra Bland and you change lanes without signaling, should you have to confront an armed representative of government and possibly lose your life over such an infraction when we could literally text you a ticket. Um, in the case of the young man who ran, they knew where he lived, they had his license, he could have ran, they could have let him go and then they picked him up a, a couple of days later at his house. I mean, th there are some things that, that despite the difficulty of the current situation, that really lend themselves uh, again uh, to problem solving because there's enough there's enough um, tension um, and focus uh, and, and urgency to maybe get something done. So in that sense, um, I'm hopeful, but it is very discouraging to see what what happened uh, to both of these people. In terms of staying positive. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what we were involved in recently. Um, you know, this week, uh, as a result of a um, clemency project that we started last year as a result of COVID, um, the ACLU of Kansas won the release of uh, a person who was suffering from late stage cancer and wasn't set to be released until 2024. Um, but we won what was called um, a functional incapacitation release that he was so sick, it made no sense to keep him locked up. And we have 105 clients. So to answer Van's question, um, we have to continue fighting zealously for our clients and for these issues. We can't afford to, to stop now because there are people who need us and need our voices and need this activity. Okay. Thank you, Mark. I think we're at the end of our time with you today. So I wanna thank you again for coming to Wichita State virtually. And you're, it's always good to hear from you. It's always great to see you. Uh, and just looking through the attendance list today, I know several friends popped in to see you too. So that, that's a great thing. 
Um, I'm going to share my screen here now to introduce all of you to our next speaker in the series. Um, and that will be Jeff Hayton, who is a professor, oops, let me just click right through here, uh, who is a uh, associate professor of history at Wichita State University. He'll be talking about the big lie, Nazi propaganda, anti-Semitism, and the coming of the Third Reich. Uh, again, that'll be next Wednesday at two o'clock, also by Zoom. Uh, and in the chat, there had also been a question about uh, if these uh, presentations would be made available and they will be on our YouTube channel generally about a week after the presenter has given them live. So look at our YouTube channel, that's um, Fairmount College, just uh, Google that at YouTube. So um, Mark, there, the chat today was also pretty uh, robust and I'll make sure to send that to you so you can, you can have Thank that. You. Okay. Thank you everyone.